Hi everyone, welcome to our third week of remote learning. Um, I hope you all are adjusting and doing well. We're going to continue with our um, second full lecture in Unit 3, Micro-Human Interactions. You're going to be following along with your lecture course pack, so make sure you've got this ready. And we're going to be taking notes from pages 66 to 71 in your lecture course pack. And the lecture review guide is found on page 72. Right. We've got three major topics, the human microbiome and pathogens and infections. These two topics right here are going to be covered in chapter 16 in your book and the epidemiology portion of this lecture, which includes um, transmission of infectious diseases and some common epidemiological terms. This information will be found in chapter 19 of your book. All right, so let's begin. At the top of page 66, we have some fill-in-the-blank questions in your course pack. And here we are going to address those. And so in mutualism, or in mutualistic relationships, these are relationships where both partners benefit. So not all microbes are bad. Um, you know that 99.9% .9 of bacteria don't cause infections. And in fact, the majority are either going to be mutualistic or commensalistic. So in terms of mutualistic bacteria, a lot of them are found in our guts and they can produce some valuable compounds. So what we provide them is a home and nutrition and what they can provide us are some uh, small organic molecules and potentially vitamins. In commensalism or commensalistic relationships, one partner benefits while the other is unaffected. And so in the case of microbes in humans, our gut microbes and our skin microbes benefit from living on and in us, but humans are relatively unaffected by their present. It's actually thought now that even our commensal microbes do provide some benefit to us by serving as a protective barrier against infection. So even our commensal microbes can potentially help us a little bit. The reason we study medical microbiology, however, is because of these parasitic relationships. And this is when a pathogen, like a bacterium or a virus, causes an infection. So in parasitic relationships, uh, the micro benefits, but the human host is harmed. And oftentimes in these parasitic relationships, the person that is harmed, we would call the host, we use that word a lot, and the partner that benefits, like the virus or the bacterium, this would either be called the parasite or the pathogen. Okay. All right. So the human body um, has as many bacterial and um, other types of microbial cells on and in it than we have human cells. So we are just as much microbe as we are human if you look at just cell numbers. But we don't have microbes in every location of the human body. Um, instead, we're going to find them dominating in a couple of places. Where we have the most microbes would be our digestive tract or our GI tract. So the GI tract is everything from the mouth to the anus. So we've got the mouth, the pharynx, the esophagus, and the, the esophagus goes down to our stomach. The stomach leads to our small intestines, which is this jumbled up mass right here. The small intestine leads to the large intestine, and then the large intestine empties into the rectum, and then that's where feces exits the body. So all along this GI tract, we're going to uh, find microbes, and most of our microbes are actually found in the large intestine. So the large intestine is the most dense area for microbes. And I believe it's about 10 to the 14, which is about a trillion. All right, so second to the GI tract, we have our skin. Our skin um, houses a lot of microbes. And in addition to our skin, we have our upper respiratory tract. So the upper respiratory tract includes the mouth, the nose, um, 
the throat in the throat. The lower respiratory tract should be sterile. So the lower respiratory tract, which includes our lungs and our uh, trachea, should be sterile. Um, all right, other places we will find microbes will include any opening or orifice to the outside, and then the tissues associated with those. And so these openings or orifices would include not just the mouth, but also the nose, the eyes, the ears, the anus, the vagina, and the urethra. And uh, the locations that we should not find microbes um, includes not just the lungs, but other internal organs as well. So not the internal organs of the GI tract, but our true internal organs that are found in, in our body cavities. So these would be the lungs, for example, but also internal organs. The heart, the kidneys, the liver, etc. The brain. And not just in these organs, but also the fluids that circulate in our body. So this would include our blood, our cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF for short. This is the fluid that is found in our nervous system. It um, is found surrounding the brain and the spinal cord and then also um, urine prior to its entry into the urethra. After urine is formed in the kidneys, it'll be stored in the bladder, and then it exits through the urethra. So the bladder and the kidneys, uh, the urine that's found there, should also be sterile. All right, so next in your course pack, I ask you how a newborn baby initially acquires his or her microbiome. And the gastrointestinal tract of a fetus is sterile prior to it being born. And so there are certain events in a newborn's life that lead to the colonization of this uh, gast of its gastrointestinal tract. And I'm going to give you a hint. So the first microorganisms that colonize, one is going to be E. coli, which is a common gastrointestinal organism. And then the other is lactobacillus, which is a lactic acid bacterium, and it makes lactic acid on our skin and in other areas like the vagina. And so one of the most important events is childbirth. So during childbirth, the baby is exposed to the vagina or the vaginal canal. If it's a vaginal birth, if it's not a vaginal birth, doctors will often take swabs from the mother's vagina and actually place that in the baby's mouth. But not just the vaginal microbes enter the, the um, newborn's gastrointestinal tract through the mouth. There's also some fecal matter that gets in as well. So during childbirth, the mother will often poop a little, a lot depending on the person. And so that sounds really disgusting, but that is how babies get their first E. coli. Yay. And then after these two events, we have skin-to-skin um, -skin contact. For example, not just skin-to-skin, -skin, but also through breastfeeding. That would be another important exposure to microbes. And the, that exposure early on is very important. And so it's important because the microbes a newborn is and an infant is exposed to will be important in the development of a healthy immune system. And so the, your book calls it oral tolerance. The more microbes uh, the baby's immune system starts to recognize as being a normal thing that enters the body, um, 
it'll better recognize foreign invaders versus the bacteria that are just normally there because of the food you eat. Um, the microbes that you have also protect against infection. So if you have a billion cells in your gastrointestinal tract, you're much less likely to come down with an infection um, in your GI tract than if you have only a thousand cells. And so bacteria have to compete for those attachment sites on, our, on the cells that line our GI tract and our skin. And so right now we're washing our hands a lot because of coronavirus, uh, but it's important to remember to um, not overwash if you don't need to, because we really need to keep our, our normal microbiome intact. Microbes also can help with aiding digestion and they can make very useful molecules for us, like vitamins or other small molecules. Um, one example would be a molecule formed from fermentation called butyrate. Its effects are not well known, but it's associated um, with a healthy immune response and nervous system. So some molecules that microbes make will interact with our nervous system. All right. And if um, your microbiome is disturbed, um, this could lead to health issues like allergies, autoimmune diseases, infections like C. diff, and even obesity has been linked to an unbalanced microbiome or a lowered microbiome in the GI tract. And so things that affect um, our microbiome or things that could harm our microbiome include the overuse of disinfectants and antibiotics and other types of antimicrobials. Um, so I mentioned again, we are washing our hands a lot, but we're also disinfecting a lot right now because of coronavirus. And this is okay. We're living in a different time right now. And we want to make sure we're as careful as possible with we, the things that we bring into our house for, from the grocery store, for example. And so a lot of things, you know, we're disinfecting. And that's okay. But if you haven't had any groceries in your house in a day and it's just you living in your household and your immediate family members living in your household and you've been social distancing and not bringing in anything but microbes from the fresh air and the outdoors, then it's not necessary to over disinfect all the every surface in your home. Um, so we want to remember, you know, that we can promote a healthy microbiome by eating a good diet and exposing ourselves to the good microbes like those found in fresh air or soil. Um, so going outside for your exercise right now is really important. Um, also, an unhealthy diet can lead to an unbalanced microbiome. So if you eat um, foods that are very processed or high in sugar, certain types of microbes will respond to that more than others, and that can throw off the balance of the microbes that are found in your GI tract. All right, so ways that we can, other than, you know, fresh air and outdoor exercise um, and a good diet, there are a couple of other ways that we can promote a healthy microbiome. And diet is actually one of them that I'm going to be going over. So one of these is probiotics. And a probiotic is sort of the opposite of an antibiotic, right? Instead of killing microbes, we are ingesting living organisms. So in a probiotic like yogurt right here, or this supplement, some probiotics are served as supplements that contain lactobacillus species within the supplements. All right, so obviously our genus and species names should be underlined or italics. And of course, our species name should be lowercase. So this label is a little scientifically incorrect, but we'll forgive them. Um, so these types of products that contain lactobacillus actually introduce those microbes into our GI tract, and so that would be considered a probiotic, eating microbes. And there are other probiotic products that can be applied to skin, under your arms, to help with odor, um, or you know, you could just use soap and water. Prebiotics, on the other hand, these are not the ingestion of microbes. But this is the ingestion of nutrients that support the growth of good microbes in your gut or your GI tract. And so fructan sugars um, might be sugars found in apples. Um, and these sugars promote the growth of our good microbes rather than the microbes that will grow on processed sugars and processed foods. 
onions and garlic also have fibers and compounds in them that promote the growth of our good GI tract microbes. So make sure you eat a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, not just for the vitamins that they offer, but for the sake of promoting our microbiome um, as a prebiotic food. All right. So we've covered the microbes that are good for us, and now we are going to transition into the reason why most of you all are in this class, to learn about the microbes that cause disease. So um, just to start with some general terms, an infection or an infectious disease is when a pathogen enters and replicates inside of a host, and this results in some sort of damage, um, like a sore throat, um, diarrhea, etc. A pathogen would be the microorganism that causes that infection. So the pathogen is the name of the microbe. The infectious disease would be the thing that happens because of the pathogen. So for example, C. diff would be Clostridium difficile. That would be the pathogen. The disease would be antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Um, a true pathogen will cause infection in any host regardless of whether or not that host is well or immunocompromised. So for example, coronavirus or influenza. These are pathogens that will cause an infection no matter how healthy you are. Um, there's not much you can do to protect yourself against an infection by one of these types of pathogens. On the other hand, opportunistic pathogens, these are microbes that cause infection rarely, only when a host's defenses are down or if the host is immunocompromised. And so an example of an opportunistic pathogen would be um, a microorganism called Cryptococcus neoformans, and it can cause a it's a fungus that only causes lung infections in um, immunocompromised individuals. So a lot of the microbes that we work with in the lab um, aren't true pathogens, but they might be opportunistic pathogens. Another example would be Klebsiella. All right, so in order for a microbe to be a pathogen, it has to have more than just a membrane, ribosomes, and a chromosome, and a cell wall. It has to have things that make it destructive, right? So if a microbe has special cellular characteristics that contribute to the ability to cause infection, then we call them virulence factors. So the way that I like to see it, um, think of it is every cell has a cell membrane, a chromosome, and ribosomes. Oh, and then the cell wall, if it's a bacterium. These things don't necessarily make a pathogen a pathogen because all cells have them and they just need them to survive. But if a pathogen or if a microorganism can make a capsule, then that'll help it evade phagocytosis by our white blood cells. If a microorganism has flagella, especially paratrichous flagella, it might be able to enter the urinary tract. Um, likewise, a microorganism might produce certain types of exoenzymes or toxins that cause tissue damage. These would be examples of virulence factors, things that cells do to help cause an infection, or things that cells have that help the microbe cause an infection. And we're gonna go over loads more examples as we get into the stages of infection. Uh, one other term we haven't talked about is infectious dose, and this refers to the number of microbes required to cause an infection, or for that infection to become established. So for example, the example your book uses is Shigella. Shigella has an infectious dose of 10 to 100 cells. Let's just say 10 cells. That means you only need a little bit of Shigella to get really sick. So this is pretty dangerous. It's a lot easier to get sick if you're exposed. Um, Salmonella, on the other hand, another GI tract pathogen, has an infectious dose of around 10 to the 6 cells, which is a million. So this is a much larger infectious dose, and it's much more difficult to get sick if you're exposed. You have to be exposed to a lot 
if you're going to come down with an infection of salmonella. All right, next on your list, we have primary versus secondary infections. Instead of defining these, I'm just gonna give you an example. The first example is with a cold versus a sinus infection. So let's say Taylor gets a cold and their nasal passages become inflamed. The cold would be the primary infection or the first infection that happened. But because of that infection, the sinuses aren't draining properly and that condition supports another infection. One week later, Taylor comes down with a sinus infection. And so this sinus infection would not have occurred if the cold hadn't occurred first. So a secondary infection usually is supported by a primary infection happening first. The primary infection results in some sort of condition that allows the secondary pathogen to thrive and cause that secondary infection. The second example I have um, is something you may or may not have done in lab already. The lab was called commensalism. And so let's say Jamie has a joint replacement surgery and aseptic technique is not used very well. And Jamie comes down with a staph infection in the joint. And the staph infection becomes resistant to antibiotics or it's a case of MRSA. And then later, um, Jamie comes down with another infection, a bone infection that's called osteomyelitis. And this infection is caused by an anaerobe, cause um, the clostridium species of the genus Clostridium. And so what happens here is the staph infection uses up all the oxygen and that creates anaerobic conditions for the Clostridium to survive and cause an infection. So in this case, the staph infection would be the primary infection, and the secondary infection would be the anaerobic osteomyelitis. All right. So finally, we've got a couple of other terms. Um, an endogenous infection would be an infection caused by our own microbes. So when a microbe gets from the gastrointestinal tract to the urinary tract, it may cause a urinary tract infection. So an endogenous infection is when a microbe from our own body gets to somewhere where it doesn't belong. Nosocomial infections are also called hospital-acquired infections, so that would be a synonym. This would be hospital-acquired infection. This would be an infection that's obtained in a hospital or a clinical setting. So let's say you go to the emergency room for... Um, a broken finger and a patient sitting next to you has coronavirus and then because you were in the hospital you caught the coronavirus. So this is one reason right now why hospitals are setting up special wings or tents outside their ERs specifically just for coronavirus patients. And speaking of coronavirus it's also referred to as a zoonosis um, or a zoonotic disease is an infection that came from an animal or a non-human animal. Um, and so both, um, not just coronavirus or COVID-19, but other coronavirus strains like SARS and MERS, these were all outbreaks that started when a coronavirus leapt from an animal like a bat to a human. Um, even though those infections are now spread human to human, we call them zoonoses because of their animal origin. All right. Now we are going to move on to how pathogens cause infections through these five stages. And we actually had an activity in Unit 1 about this. Very briefly, I've, um, in the past, I've related to these stages of infection to um, stages of a toxic relationship. And so first, the toxic person or pathogen has to get in, find a way in, and we're going to call that way in a portal of entry. Then the 
microbe or the toxic person latches on or attaches firmly. We also call that adherence. The third stage is going to be escaping detection or escaping notice. And so in, from the perspective of a microbe or a pathogen, that would be evading our immune system or escaping notice from our host defenses. The uh, fourth stage is causing tissue damage. So this is when our destruction happens. So stage four, I'll casually call it destruction. And in bet before stages four and five, right up until this period, we'll often call this the incubation period or the period of time it takes before you notice that you're sick, before you start experiencing symptoms. And in this fourth stage, this is usually when symptoms appear. All right. And then finally, um, once the damage is done, the pathogen leaves or exits. So in the fifth stage, we have the pathogen exiting the host. And then in transmission, the pathogen just moves on to its next victim. All right, so any cellular characteristic that contributes to any one of these stages would be considered a virulence factor. So for example, fimbrae and capsules contribute to the second stage, but capsules will also be able to contribute to the third stage. So if I give you a cellular characteristic, you should be able to tell me which stage or stages it participates in, in terms of that pathogen being able to cause disease. Um, not all of the virulence factor are, factors are listed on here, so we're going to go through each of these stages individually, but ones that aren't listed might include something like flagella, because this might help a microbe enter the urinary tract from the gastrointestinal tract. Something like endospores might help with transmission of a disease. For example, C. diff can last for a really long period of time unless you use a sterilant. And so if you're exposed to the endospores of Clostridium difficile, then that infectious disease is more easily transmissible. So endospores might help with transmission um, and things like toxins or exoenzymes will help with the destruction stage. All right, so stage one, we're gonna go through each of these individually. The first one is getting in or finding a portal of entry. So microbes first have to get in um, so common um, sites would be the skin or a break in skin for a skin infection or for circulatory system infections. Uh, the mouth is the common port of entry for GI tract infections. The respiratory tract, the ports of entry are usually are going to be the mouth and the nose, not usually, but almost always. The eyes are also an important portal of entry. And so this is why you're not supposed to rub your eyes with your hands right now unless you wash your hands first, uh, because you can transmit coronavirus if you rub your eyes with your hands. And then in the urogenital tract, microbes can enter through the urethra or the vagina. And we call these exogenous ports of entry because they come from the outside. If a pathogen comes from within, then we call it an endogenous port of entry. And so um, if a microbe enters from the human body, um, just from one location to another, for example, I've mentioned that flagella can help with microbes getting from the GI tract to the urinary tract. Uh, that would be um, an endogenous port of entry or an endogenous infection. Um, but fistulas, these are true endogenous ports of entry because these are connections or path passageways between one body region and another. So if there's a fistula between the GI tract and the bladder, that can cause chronic and continuous bladder infections or urinary tract infections.
All right. Once a microbe gets in, the next stage is to latch on or adhere. So adherence or attachment are synonyms. These would both be considered stage two. Anything that helps a microbe attach or adhere would be considered a virulence factor that helps with this stage. So the first one is fimbrae. This, all of these are going to be review terms from unit one. Fimbrae, if you recall, are those pili that line the surface of cells and help them attach to surfaces. And so here, that surface is the epithelial surfaces of our own host cells. So fimbrae, which are found on bacteria, will help those bacteria attach. The second um, mode of attachment is a capsule. And we learned in unit one that capsules are extracellular polysaccharide layers that help a cell avoid phagocytosis. But these layers also help microbes stick to surfaces. So I call it a sugary sticky coating. And once a microbe forms a capsule and it sets itself down, that polysaccharide layer can grow and form like a biofilm covering all of the cells. So this whole thing might be a biofilm and it's very sticky. An individual cell with this polysaccharide layer would be a capsule forming pathogen. So capsules also help with attachment. I don't have a picture of a surface protein, but surface proteins, as the name suggests, these are simply proteins that are found on cell surfaces. that help the cell attach. I don't have any specific examples, but there are some surface proteins that help these cells stick to host cells. And spikes, these are going to be for viruses only. If you recall from unit one and the structure of a virus, viruses have protein spikes on their capsid, and those spikes help attach to host cell receptors. So if this is the virus and here's the spike, the spike is what helps attach to the host cell. So fimbrae, capsules, surface proteins, and spikes on viruses, these are all virulence factors that help with the second stage of causing an infection. In the third stage of causing an infection, we have evading host defenses, or when the pathogen escapes our notice, or our attempts to notice it. So bacteria have multiple ways of escaping notice, or evading our host defenses. Um, the first that I have listed in your course pack is escaping phagocytosis. So this is the first one that we learned about in unit one, and we learned that capsules are kind of like invisibility cloaks, and so our white blood cells, which I draw as Pac-Man, that normally ingest a microbe, that's called phagocytosis. A phagocyte is a white blood cell that does phagocytosis. And so organisms that have capsules escape notice from the white blood cells and therefore they evade phagocytosis. All right, the second one on your list is the production of a toxin that actually kills white blood cells. And so a leukocyte is the name for a white blood cell and then cytin means to kill. So leukocytins are toxins that kill white blood cells. And so if a bacterium can kill a white blood cell, that would be a very effective way of escaping that one of our primary host defense mechanisms. Next on the list in your course pack on page 69 is survival inside of a phagocyte. And so there are some pathogens, let's say, Here's our white blood cell, and it just ingested this pathogen. 
Uh, white blood cells have lysosomes that will fuse with this pathogen and then try to digest it. But if the pathogen can survive inside, for example, with a capsule, then it can, has a ticket around the entire human body and it can last inside this phagocyte. So survival inside of a phagocyte is a really important strategy for a pathogen that will help it escape notice. And so capsules help with escaping phagocytosis and survival inside of a white blood cell or a phagocyte. Pathogens can also hide within other cells. So if a pathogen enters or invades another host cell, our white blood cells might not recognize it. Next on our list, we have evading antibody detection. There are some pathogens that um, produce multiple antigens, and we call this antigenic variation. So an antigen is a recognition protein on the cell's surface. If a microbe can produce multiple types of antigens, then it'll be harder for a white blood cell to recognize it. So let's say here's a pathogen, and then one day it is producing its green path antigens. The white blood cell will recognize these green antigens and it'll form antibodies against these green antigens. Yay, our white blood cell developed an immune response. But let's say this pathogen switches its antigen production and the next day it makes a different antigen. We'll give this one a red color. So if it produces a different antigen, then the antibodies that attached to this antigen and this pathogen now won't recognize these ones. So by switching up the antigens, the system might not recognize um, the pathogen with the um, altered antigens. And we call that antigenic variation because these microbes can produce a variety of antigens. All right, and then finally, if a host has a lowered immune system or is immunocompromised, then that can help the pathogen evade notice or escape notice as well. Our fourth stage is causing tissue damage, and this can happen through exoenzymes, endotoxin, exotoxins, or an overstimulation of the immune system. So exoenzymes are, um, we learned about exoenzymes in unit two. They digest very large macromolecules outside of the cell. Examples of exoenzymes that we learned about in that unit were um, collagenase. So collagenase can help break down the collagen fibers in our skin. And we learned about lipase that will help break down the lipids that are found below the epithelial cells in the subcutaneous layer of our skin. And we also learned about streptokinase, which was an exoenzyme that breaks down or digests blood clots. So exoenzymes can cause tissue damage. Toxins are different than exoenzymes. A toxin is a chemical or a, a molecule that's poisonous to the other organism, but it doesn't necessarily break down macromolecules like an enzyme does. So toxins don't have to be proteins. They may be small peptides, but they don't have to have any sort of metabolic function like an exoenzyme does. The first toxin that we're going to learn about is one that we've already seen before. So endotoxin is also called lipopolysaccharide or LPS for short. And this is the molecule that is found in the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. So gram-negative bacteria have that outer membrane and those squiggles that we drew were the lipopolysaccharide. The lipid portion of that lipopolysaccharide, if this sheds off and gets into the bloodstream, it can be very toxic and we, therefore we call that endotoxin because it comes from the bacterium itself. It's an actual part of the bacterium that can be toxic. An exotoxin isn't a part of the bacterium. It's a chemical that is made, that is secreted out like an exoenzyme, but then it just causes damage to tissue. So here we've got cells 
creating exotoxins that are damaging epithelial cells. Uh, some exotoxins are called hemolysins. This means they damage red blood cells. Neurotoxins affect our nervous system or our neuromuscular junctions. And then enterotoxins, these are toxins that affect our gastrointestinal tract and can cause inflammation and diarrhea. Another way that our tissues can be destroyed is if this immune system is overstimulated. So if our T cells are overreacting or if we're having a very strong immune response, inflammation can occur and fluid can start building up. This is one of the reasons why influenza and coronavirus can be so dangerous. If fluid builds up in the lungs, then that can create pneumonia or the lack of oxygen being able to diffuse across the cell linings of the alveoli. So fluid buildup in the lungs can be very serious and can result in death. All right, now we are um, on page 70, um, stage five, exiting the host. So the pathogen eventually will leave so that it can find its next victim. Ways that respiratory tract pathogens leave would be through the mouth or the nose, so through coughing, sneezing, breathing, etc. Uh, skin pathogens usually are, you know, leave from the skin, or pathogens can leave from an open wound, or from the blood through an insect bite, or through a needle. Uh, pathogens can also come out through the urine or semen, um, through vaginal secretions as well, as well as through fecal matter. So those are all different ways pathogens can leave the body. And I want to leave you with one fun fact about respiratory droplets, because we've been hearing a lot about respiratory droplets um, in the news because of our coronavirus. So droplets from breathing can travel up to six feet. And this is why it's suggested you keep a six feet distance when you're social distancing. However, droplets that come from coughing or sneezing can travel much further. These droplets have a force associated with them or a high velocity, and these can travel up to six meters, which is about three times longer, or several times longer than six feet. And so if you are coughing or sneezing right now, it is best that you do not go out to the grocery store because that six feet difference you are uh, required to keep won't um, protect others from your cough or sneeze droplets. All right. In chapter 19, um, chapter 19 now talks about uh, transmission of disease. So I like to include this in the same lecture because transmission of the disease is when we're exiting one host and we're going into another. So we have the fifth stage, which is leaving. And then we have the first stage, which is entering the body. And so transmission is kind of like a sixth stage in the chain of infection. And if a pathogen is transmitted from one organism to another, or one human to another, then we would call that a communicable or a contagious disease. It's going right from one host into another host. There are some infections, however, that aren't transmitted from person to person. They are, trans they, and we call them non-communicable diseases. So non-communicable infections could be caused by something like a soil fungus that mutated and now suddenly causes an infection in your lungs after you've breathed it in. Or it could be that you have inhaled some Bacillus anthracis endospores um, when you were playing around in some dry dirt. And so um, not all infections will come from another person. If it is, they do not come from another person, then it's called a non-communicable infection. And something that is highly communicable, like coronavirus, we call them contagious. All right, so here are some different ways that infections can be transmitted from one individual to another. Direct contact, droplets, and vertical transmission, these are all indirect mechanisms, or sorry, the opposite. These are all our direct modes of infectious disease transmission. So direct contact includes um, touching, kissing, sex. 
droplets includes those respiratory droplets that come from breathing, coughing, or sneezing. And these droplets have to be associated with water. And they are heavy and they usually drop to the ground within about six feet or so. Vertical transmission refers to the transmission of pathogens from a mother to a fetus. So rather than person to person outside of a human body, vertical is when it goes from the mother, crosses the placenta, and enters the fetus. Aerosols, fomites, vehicles, and vectors, these are all modes of indirect transmission. An aerosol is similar to a droplet, but it's a much smaller particle in the air and it doesn't necessarily have to be associated with water. And it can travel much further. Because it can travel much further, it may not be um, directly from one person to another standing in close distance. So we would call it indirect um, because it the distance those aerosols can travel. A fomite is a physical object like a keyboard, a cell phone, um, a doorknob, some sort of inanimate object that one person touches leaves or sneezes on, leaves the pathogen there, and someone else then later picks it up by touching that fomite or that object. Vehicles would be contaminated food and water. So a vehicle could be just um, a food or water that's carrying the pathogen from one diseased individual, and then you drink or eat it and get sick. A vector is a biological vehicle, and so most vectors are insects. Like, for example, the mosquito is the vector for the disease malaria. And then one other note on a term that is in your course pack. We are now at the, um, on page 71, our last page in our lecture notes. The fecal oral route of transmission, that's supposed to be in bold. The fecal oral route of transmission refers to any type of fecal microbe that gets on a fomite or that gets in contaminated food and water or that say gets on your hands. And that, those microbes then indirectly end up in another individual's mouth. Let's say they touch that object and then touch their face or their mouths, or um, they eat or drink that contaminated food. That means that fecal microbes can go right from feces into another person's mouth. So through fomites or through vehicles, um, if it's a fecal pathogen that's being transmitted, we call that the fecal oral route of transmission. All right, our final topic is on common terms that are used in epidemiology. And um, we'll start with some of the basics. So prevalence versus incidence. Prevalence is the number of cases of an infection per 100,000 people. That's usually the standard um, that is used for population sizes. So not necessarily the total number of cases, but the number of cases normalized to the um, population. Incidence refers to the number of new cases that are occurring per population size. And so um, in coronavirus, for example, the New York Times gives new daily numbers. Um, and so on the y-axis here, we have the number of cases that have been reported every single day. So each number, so this one would be right around 21,500. This would have been, if we divide that by um, the population size and normalize it to per 100,000, that would be the incident value for that day. The total number of cases, however, would be the prevalence. So for coronavirus, I updated this on March 29th, which was Sunday. Um, there were a total of 135,000 cases in the United States with just over 2,300 deaths, or just under 2,400 deaths. The mortality rate, um, this refers to the number of deaths due to a certain type of disease per population size. 
Um, the death rate that we've been seeing for coronavirus is technically called the case fatality rate. And the case fatality rate is the number that die compared to the number that report having had the infection. So that fatality rate is different than this mortality rate. A mortality rate is the number of deaths compared to the entire size of the population, not just the number that are infected. So these are the only three terms that are in your study guide, so I will leave it um, at having you know these ones. But I wanted to give you an idea of some of the things that we are seeing in the news. And since I am on that topic, I thought I would show you a couple of websites that I've been checking out every day. The New York Times has a running case count and map of coronavirus cases. And so you can see the number of cases in every single state and the total number affected, infected, so now we have over 160,000 positive cases and over 3,000 deaths. And you can also check out the number of new cases every day and the number of cases in each state. Michigan also has a coronavirus page. Put this down, I'm going to refresh it. It um, Updates every day at 2 p.m. So let's see if they've updated it today and they have so we've had in the last day We've had over a thousand cases or over 1100 and we are now up to 75 Deaths in the state of Michigan. You can also and also this is michigan.gov. They have their own uh, coronavirus page if you look at the cumulative data you get cases by county and it's color-coded on this map right here, which is really useful. And you'll see that they um, are summarizing the numbers of cases, which is not quite the same thing as prevalence because it's not normalized population size. And there's other data reported as well, um, like um, the percentage that are deceased by sex, um, etc. So that's a really good one. And finally, the last one that I like to look at is the John Hopkins website for coronavirus. They've built this interactive map that you can move around and check on cases in a number of different countries. And here in the United States, which is now the epicenter of this pandemic, um, you can take a look at the total number of cases and how many have been reported for each country, as well as the death count and the death totals for different um, regions in the world. So this brings us to our next slide, which is pandemics versus other types of outbreaks. And so an, um, a pandemic, we're going to start with this one because this is what coronavirus is. A pandemic is a, a severe worldwide outbreak. And this often involves a new strain of a virus or a pathogen. Our last outbreak before coronavirus our last big one, our bit last big pandemic, was um, the swine flu in 2009. And so it's usually very widespread. It's on every continent. Um, and I think if you look at this John Hopkins map, you will see that there's even cases in Greenland. Let's see if there's any in Antarctica. Okay, none in Antarctica. Phew. But every other continent, you can see it exists. Something like influenza, um, seasonal influenza, would be considered an epidemic. So an epidemic is more of a sudden and acute outbreak, and it can be um, annual, and it can be in densely populated areas. So I'm going from the most severe um, so this is multiple epidemics occurring all over the world. Um, in a regular epidemic, they don't necessarily um, spread all over the world. And then we have endemic outbreaks, which occur in a geographical location. These are usually isolated to a geographical region, usually because of a bird population or a mosquito population that's associated with that region. And then you have sporadic outbreaks, which is just, you have a K, an outbreak overall, let's say there's 20 new infections, but you've got, they're just all over the place. So a sporadic outbreak is when there's just one case um, and there's no rhyme or reason 
where they are occurring. So we call that a sporadic outbreak. All right, I'm going to end it with that. Um, you have your lecture terms and your concepts on page 72. So don't forget to take a look at those before you complete your quiz for this week. I'm going to hold off on um, a McGraw-Hill homework assignment until after our next week. So next week you'll have a double homework assignment. This week you'll have a quiz over what you've learned. All right, everyone, take care. I'm signing out.